Good morning. Did you guys bring your Bibles today? Turn to Luke chapter 14. I'm going to pray. Let us pray. Dear God, let these words illuminate our minds that we may hear from you. Let the words I speak not be mine, but be yours. All this I ask in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Luke 14, verse 1. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to share a meal in the home of one of the leaders of the Pharisee, they were watching him closely. Well, how nice. Jesus and his ragtag group of followers were invited to a nice, fancy Sabbath dinner, Saturday evening meal, or maybe it was a Sunday afternoon meal. Either way, it was a really nice dinner. Must have been a sight to see. This nicely dressed Pharisee. His servants probably were dressed nicer than Jesus and his group was. Nice home furnishings. And in walks Jesus and his disciples, who probably haven't bathed in who knows when. So, why was Jesus invited? There must have been some type of ulterior motive. Why was Jesus being watched so carefully? We read many times in the Gospels about how the Pharisees were trying to catch Jesus doing something wrong against the law of the Hebrews, something ungodly. They would ask to see the power of the Holy Spirit within him, as we read in Matthew chapter 12. They would question his understanding of God and God's laws as we read in Matthew chapter 11. Do you know that as children of God, we are being watched carefully? We see in the news every time a Christian does something wrong or ungodly. Just like the Pharisees, people are looking watching for us, watching to see if we are truly who we say we are, to see if we are really following Christ and Christ's example. But unlike Christ, we do fail. We do make mistakes. Well, this is why grace is important. We need to teach the world about grace, about God's grace. In our culture, being full of grace can have two different interpretations, let's say. Caring for others is being full of grace. Well, minding our manners and not being clumsy is what we like to call being graceful. Sometimes I may be full of grace, but I'm not always very graceful. I have to be helped up and down these things because I will trip. But one lesson in being graceful that I was taught when I was a little girl was conflicted. You see, my mom taught me one way to act, and my grandmother taught me a completely different way to act in a similar situation. My mother always told me to not take things that are given to you unless you absolutely need them. While my grandmother always told me to take those things that are given to you because it's rude not to do so. So can you see my confusion? What am I to do with these two different pieces of advice? You see, my mom is from a post-war generation where she saw a lot of waste and a lot of people protesting against such waste. She was also a single mom. And she hated the idea that 
people thought we were poverty stricken and that she couldn't provide for the both of us. My grandmother, on the other hand, grew up during the Great Depression where things were scarce and people had to rely on each other to get by. To her, it was impolite to not take something that was offered to you. That person giving you this probably felt that you needed it or wanted you to have it because they felt like you needed it more than they did. So I always grew up with these two conflicting manner lessons. So basically, I was always taught to take something, which is offered to me, and I'm grateful for it, yet I will find myself questioning if I should have taken it. Does that person need it more than I? Let me tell you a little story. About a year ago, while I was working for one of the Methodist agencies, we always had meetings that included food. Methodists are known for our love of fellowship <laughs> with food. So it never fails that there would be food left over after a meeting, and the rest of us who weren't a part of that meeting could swoop in like vultures and take whatever was left. I always took something, something little, maybe a dessert or some of the fruit that might have been left, something. This one particular day, there was a department meeting with the neighboring department in our conference room, and all that was left from their meeting were sandwiches, little half sandwiches. They offered them just to our department because there wasn't enough for the whole building to go around. And there honestly really wasn't enough for the whole department. Those of us who were there at the time, we went in, me included, and took a sandwich. Well, you see, there's a problem because I had already had lunch. And I had the sandwich in my hands. In comes a coworker who had been very busy all morning, and she had not had lunch yet. I felt bad for having the sandwich in my greedy little hands, so I offered it to her. Somehow I had embarrassed her, and then subsequently embarrassed myself, I offered her the sandwich. And she went, no, thank you, and kind of hurried off to her desk, and I felt bad. At this point, I didn't want the sandwich anymore. But what was I going to do with it? It was already in my hands. I couldn't put it back on the tray, could I? But I didn't want to eat it either. Then it dawned on me, in Nashville, if you've ever driven through Nashville, you'll notice on interstate exits or on sides of street, there's homeless people. They sell newspapers. It's actually a good ministry, the contributor. One such guy, regardless of if you buy, buy a newspaper from him or not, he'll wave and nod at you every time. So he was just right down the street. I grabbed the sandwich. I'm like, I'm going to give him this sandwich. So I walked out of the building, walked down the street, handed him the sandwich, and he said the coolest thing to me. He said, thank you, queen. I said, well, you're welcome, king. <laughs> and I wondered as I was walking back to the building, did he call me queen because I gave him the sandwich? Or, in his eyes, am I a queen? Why did I say, you're welcome, king? Is it because I wanted to be equal to him and let him know that I didn't think less of him? Or, could it possibly be that, really, prayerfully, if I thought about it, he is a king? Just as Jesus and his disciples sat down to enjoy a meal with this top-ranking Pharisee, he looked around and thought, hmm. and he began to tell this parable. Luke 14, beginning in verse 7. 
When Jesus noticed how the guests sought out the best seats at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding celebration, don't take your seat in the place of honor. Someone more highly regarded than you could have been invited by your host. The host who had invited both of you will come and say to you, give your seat to this other person. Embarrassed, you will take your seat in the least important place. When your host approaches you, he will say, friend, move up here to a better seat. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. All who lift themselves up will be brought low. And those who make themselves low will be lifted up. I can so relate to the guest. Can you see yourself in this story? So what is Jesus saying to the guest? Do you think that maybe he saw someone being embarrassed by sitting in a place where they weren't supposed to, that was reserved for someone else? Or maybe he saw someone sitting in the last possible place and the host kindly moving them forward. Which guest would you rather be? The one that was brought low by embarrassment? Or would you like to be the one that was lifted up like royalty? Continuing in verse 12. Then Jesus said to the person who had invited him, when you host a lunch or dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers, your sisters, your relatives, or rich neighbors. If you do, they will invite you in return, and that will be your reward. Instead, when you give a banquet, invite the poor, crippled, lame, and blind, and you will be blessed because they can't repay you. Instead, you will be repaid when the just are resurrected. So what is Jesus saying to us as the host? The holiday season is coming upon us. I love the holiday season. So maybe I'm not the only one. I hope I'm not the only one. But I've already begun to plan what we're going to have for Thanksgiving planning what I'm going to buy my family and friends for Christmas. Yes, for Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's and certain football games, the old homestead will be filled with those we care about most, our family and our friends. And I don't think this is a bad thing. As long as we know why we are celebrating and the Remember the reason for those holidays. We're fine. So it's for Thanksgiving, for example. We thank God for our blessings. Therefore, we know just how abundantly blessed we really are. For Christmas, we remember long ago when Mary and Joseph, young, homeless, poverty-stricken themselves, wandered into Bethlehem with no place to stay and gave birth to the king of the world. These things should be celebrated. And sharing with gifts and a nice meal, for example, are wonderful ways to celebrate. So what better time than this most perfect time for us to invite the least of these, the poor in our community, to celebrate with us in some way. So let us plan now to give to those who are less fortunate at some time in the coming months while we are planning our holiday activities. I learned that it is so much easier to give to someone who is in need than to take what I don't need. It is so much easier to be grateful for what I have than to want something that I don't necessarily need or to want something that maybe someone else needs more than I do. It is easier to say no to an offer that will not benefit me 
than to say yes and find out that I could have done without. So what should I do ultimately in the situation of giving these, been given these advice regarding the less man and le- manner lessons my mom and my grandma taught me? Well, if I had to do it over again, even though I loved the feeling I got when I gave my new homeless friend that sandwich, I sh- probably should have said no to the offer to begin with and let my coworker who had not had lunch yet Take the sandwich. Or maybe I should have a suggestion at work that when we have leftovers or if we have a meal, to invite those who are less fortunate in our community to share in the food. It is much easier to be humble to begin with and to avoid embarrassment than to exalt your own successes and be humiliated or be made humble later. Not that exalting or celebrating your successes is a bad thing. Again, it is how you celebrate that makes the difference. Who do you want to glorify? Why should we give to the less fortunate? Giving out of our abundance glorifies God. Isn't it nicer and actually easier to be the humble one, exalting others, than to be the one who is always exalted? Let us humble ourselves and let God exalt us.